The second story is a story designed to push them as far as they can go. It's unlike not just any episode of Doctor Who, it's unlike any episode of television. Auntie Iris, Mummy and Daddy. Da, 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 da. When I first read the script for this, when I was struck by, by how creepy it was. I think it's drama at its best to just have two characters, just two characters trapped, trying to find their way out. We end up on the edge of the universe, the furthest out anyone has ever been. Or so we think. They're all alone except for two awful, monstrous versions of themselves who know them as well as they know themselves. That's the key, is that they've got their memories as well. They know all the subtleties and the doubts and the guilt and the fears that each of those characters carry, and they reflect them back at them in order to scare them. All those years, I missed you. <laughs> What Russell had given us was the very best thing he possibly could, which is David and Catherine being in every single solitary minute of the whole thing. So honoured to be working with them that I wanted to walk in every day for work and think, oh, this is tough. Oh, I've got to push myself here. Oh, what shall I do here? Or how shall I play this? I think that's a great day. There's a bit of prosthetics and a bit of trickery with jaws falling and arms rolling, but really, those monsters are the creation of David and Catherine. They're not us. It, it's quite intense, especially the scenes where we play two versions of ourselves. And obviously we have people standing in for us and they have to learn both versions of the scene as well. That is quite a brain melt sometimes. We'd rehearse the scene with David and Catherine as Doctor and Donna. You should be the goodies. All right. They're us. Then we'd rehearse it with David and Catherine as like the bad Doctor and Donna, the alien versions. The notion of shit is strange. Even in this, it is limited. That was kind of like to give the doubles like a sense of how David and Catherine would do both parts. We just kept swapping it over. Action. Can we, can we get our real teeth back now? I'll finish lunch. Oh, my goodness. Wilfred Mott. Now nothing is wrong, nothing in the whole wide world. Hello, me old soldier. It's very nice, nice to be working anywhere, and especially on a, a jolly thing like this with, um, with David and Catherine and, you know, a good crew and all, a good crew, yeah. No, it's splendid, <laughs> lovely. It was uh, a job, they said, Doctor Who, read it, do it, absolutely. The fact that scripts and everything are good. And as I said, it, it's good to be working with people that you admire and enjoy and, uh, and get along with. Why is there something wrong? <laughs> OK, gas off, gas off. So uh, one of the elements here is that um, during all the chaos and the action in this scene, a plane is coming over the top and crashes not too far away from here. So essentially what we're going to do now is put a cannon here and we're going to be firing some sort of like smoke type dust effect. So it looks like it's happened a long way away and it's created this kind of charge of air and, and pressure sort of debris. I've done like a little video to work out how fast the plane is going. I watched a lot of videos of planes landing to get a sense of what it might look like. So I think it's effects are quite easy. You just say, can we have an explosion? And they're like, yep, yeah, how big do you want? I asked Danny to show me several explosions. Uh, he showed me like three and I was like, that one please. You have to take a deep, deep breath with this episode and trust it. Now, I remember sitting, writing it, thinking, should we find a cellar full of robot killers? Should we discover a vault on the spaceship that's got William Hartnell inside it? <laughs> Genuinely, I thought, for the 60th, I thought, should we do this, should we do that? And I had to, I had to have words myself. I had, to, I had to sit there going, just stay true to the idea. You said to yourself, it's just the two of them on board a spaceship with their doubles. Stick to that. It's a very important thing about writing. It's amazing how writing wanders off and does this, stick to the idea, which means trusting it, which means saying, I believe this will be a great spaceship. I believe you'll want to spend time in it. I believe you want to spend time with those two actors. I believe the flight deck will look magnificent. And it does. I mean, all, everyone's worked so hard to pull that off. And it's as a piece of design. I think it's 
Oh my god, our design team is just the best. Sensational. Wow! Nice! Big! It required a complete collaboration between VFX and art department. We had to regularly get together to discuss what that corridor would be like, how much of it we were going to build, what it would feel like, how we were going to travel the actors through it. And that required all those different departments. So Phil Sims in art department, Will Cohen in visual effects, real time in visual effects too, Dan May, who helped us design what that corridor would be. Phil created the, uh, the spaces um, with Dan and some of the concept and CG design team. And basically it was kind of driven by Phil, but actually as well by Dan, who, who was a bit of an advanced party trying to figure out how we did this corridor. So Phil's kind of uh, texture, tone and kind of gravity to the reality of the spaces, which you see behind us, uh, which are the sets. And they've got a lovely filmic kind of quality. And all of that was plugged into what is the CG environment. It will be a perfect, seamless, wonderful match of beautiful design. A lot of the early prep was working on pre-visualization with painting practice. There's animating different ways that we could film the action sequences and that's really helpful. The first stage is just coming up with extra ideas that aren't in the script or even just finding the best way of, of kind of framing what is in the script and then you can edit it with add music, add sound effects, get a sense of how that's working. Then once you've come up with your dream version First of all, you have to check that all the execs like what that dream version is. Then you've got to check, do we have enough money to film that? How much will it cost to film that? Do we have enough time to film that? And then all your ideas get sort of shrunk down again. But the previs allows you to like make mistakes and try lots of different things at an early stage without spending too much money. There was some great concept art done at the beginning of the spaceship that actually we've never varied from. It's a great design team with, with the concept artists. And that's always been the ideal, you head towards an ideal. And I think with this episode, we've actually achieved the ideal. It's, it's absolutely gorgeous. Hello, Jimbo! Can you talk? When we got brought onto this, we knew that this robot needed to stand on his own and walk very slowly, but ideally be puppeteered so that we can have much less humanoid shapes within the bottom of his body. We wanted him to feel like a robot, not a person in a suit. We wanted him to be as in-camera friendly as possible. So we ended up going with a completely bespoke aluminum frame inside of his body, which we built from the ground up, every single part inside of his body. Outside, we did a mixture of 3D printing based on the model. We sculpted, we got things CNC'd, which we then turned into fiberglass molds. And we used every process we could find to make this little guy come to life. He works as a puppet works. We can unlock all of his joints and move him around as a puppet would move and then lock him into all those positions and he stays perfectly still. So he's essentially the biggest stop motion model we've ever made in our lives. He has a little point at the very top of his head which goes down directly into his spine so it's right in line with his body and that goes on to a massive beam that hangs across the stage. So that way we're able to actually lift his weight up enough that we can puppeteer each individual joint. Otherwise, when we unlocked all the joints, he would literally fall down just like a, a toy that has loose joints. We're able to work as a team of five to lift him, have two people move his leg forward, an arm back, an arm forward, and then relax him back in that same position. You couldn't bring him on set without people falling in love with him instantly. He's just such a beautiful character, and I'm so glad we were able to build him and, and turn him into such a lovely thing. Don't forget to click below to subscribe to the official Doctor Who YouTube channel.